Please open in your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. And our focus today is going to be on verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I just uh, pray that you be with everyone uh, in the Sunday school today. I just ask that you open up and prepare our hearts. Um, deliver us from any distraction that may be before us. And just uh, open our hearts to hear your word and what you have to say about nurturing our children and bringing them up in a godly manner. I just pray that you would uh, decrease me and increase in the Holy Spirit during this time of Sunday school. It's in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name I pray and ask these things. Amen. The attitude a society has towards children tells you much about the society's values and belief system. Unfortunately, we live in a world where children are often viewed as a commodity or even worse, an inconvenience. We live in a day in which children are considered optional. And to any woman that would say, my body, my choice, I'd have to ask, why is it the choice after you're pregnant? Is there not a choice before that? What, what, did, that, what did that innocent child do to deserve death before they even had a chance at life? Many people view children as a hassle, as unwanted items in their family. What does the Bible say? In Psalm 127, verse 3, it says, Children are an heritage of the Lord. The word heritage means a possession or an inheritance. In other words, your children are precious gifts from God, and you should view them as such. A legacy of faith spans generations, but it will not develop by default. You could leave your children a bunch of money, you can leave them stocks and bonds, and you can leave them a house. But the most important thing is to leave them a godly legacy, an example of how to walk the Christian life. There's nothing more important you can leave for your children than that. If we as Christian parents don't prepare them to walk the godly life and leave that example for them, we're leaving them void of the most important thing in life. So in point one, we want to model the Christian life before our children. The greatest gift we can give our children is a good example. Wouldn't it be great if our legacy was, when we're all old and silver-haired, is that our children are saying, I'm, I'm thankful that you kept us in a, in a good church and and led a godly example and showed us the right way to follow so that we can help bring your grandchildren up in the same way. That's the biggest blessing I think I could receive. The truth is our children are growing up in a world in which they can easily be discouraged about the possibility of succeeding in the Christian family, but we have the opportunity to give our children a model of a working Christian family. So point A, we want to model the Christian life <coughs> in our daily walk. Proverbs 23, verse 26 tells us, My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. The simple fact is, children do what they see. So that's why it's important for us to be those models in their life and raise them up in the right way. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says, Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Few things generate disappointment and rebellion in the heart of a child like an inconsistent model of the Christian life. If you don't have any teenagers, I'm about to have some. But um, I remember when I was a teenager, if there's some inconsistency in what you're saying and what you're doing, I got a pretty good way of throwing a two-by-four through it, poking that kind of hole, right? 
So teenagers are going to be pretty good about exposing that and exploiting it. Our goal must be to show a consistent model. The word provoke used in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 means to exasperate to anger. There are many young people living with anger today. Um, the amount of children that are growing up in single-parent homes is increasing. And some of that leads to anger, um, which can be seen in the prison systems as well. There's a lot of things that tie in. There's, there's three things that really raise your chances of being a successful adult. It's coming from a nuclear family, having two parents in the home, graduating high school, and not getting pregnant before you graduate high school, or getting someone pregnant before you graduate high school. Those three things determine a great amount. And so um, if you look in our prison systems, there's a lot of anger from not having uh, the family around them, these children that grow up to be adults. Maintaining order and discipline in your family has nothing to do with the tone or volume of, of your voice. It has everything to do with the character of your heart and the commitment of your life. We are to model the Christian life in our daily walk. Point B, we want to model the Christian life in our marriages. The husband-wife relationship is a picture of God's love for the church. The church is called the bride of Christ. The picture of love that our children see in our marriages is the picture they will have of God's love. And I got to tell you, I am so thankful my parents have been together for 54 and a half years. And that's, that's a great testament to their commitment to each other and their commitment to God. 54 years is a long time, you know, to me. I'm, I'm looking back and I'm like, wow. That's a lot of patience. That's a lot of long suffering. Is, is it always a bed of roses? Of course not. I saw them argue, right? Who hasn't seen that before? But then I saw resolve as well. Because we are supposed to be long-suffering toward each other, long-suffering toward our spouse, long-suffering toward the brethren, long-suffering toward the sinner that you're witnessing to, because they need Jesus. And we're not supposed to hate the sinner. We're supposed to hate the sin. So we have to be long-suffering with those that we're witnessing to. It's especially difficult when it's a family member because you love them in a different way than, than just someone you're trying to witness to that doesn't have Jesus, but you grew up with them, and they're, you know what they have coming for them if they don't repent of their sin and come to the trusting knowledge of Jesus Christ. The greatest gift a father can give his children is to love their mother. Children receive a great sense of security by seeing love demonstrated between their parents. Conversely, they receive a great sense of insecurity when they see fighting and hear talk of divorce. This insecurity plagues and haunts young people for years to come, and it will impact their own families down the road. This could be one of the reasons the age at which people are getting married keeps going up. They've lost confidence that marriage can work. You see everybody around you giving up. And you think of how, well, maybe this, just, maybe this just isn't the right way. God has the perfect plan. It's in, it was meant to be. It's just that if you're going to look at what society is doing, as you're an example, you're looking in the wrong place. We must provide our children with an example of marriage relationships that work as God intended. Point two, we need to mentor our children in the Christian life. Modeling is primarily the display of a godly testimony. Of a godly testimony. Mentoring refers to a parent who is actively involved in training his ch child Mentoring is taking the lead and participating in a young life to teach and train. 
The word mentor comes from the Greek epics of Homer. When Odysseus was preparing to leave home to fight in the Trojan War, he asked his most trusted and wisest counselor, mentor, to guide the education and training of his son, Telemachus, in his absence. He knew the need for someone wise and experienced to shape and mold a young life. And that, that holds true. As parents, that, we're supposed to be the, the model. Let's say you had a sibling that passed away and they have children. Well, you, you know, someone's got to pick up the torch and be that mentor in that young child's life. They need to see that walk. Point A, we mentor children by nurturing them. To nurture means to provide conditions favorable to healthy growth. A gardener who wants healthy crops pulls out the weeds and puts in fertilizer for his plants. In our children's lives, we need to help them remove their sins that keep them from being fruitful. We have to put the word of God, God commands, we have to put in the word of God, God commands us to nurture them to help them to grow. It's a tragedy if our children grow up physically but do not grow up spiritually. This means we must correct the mistakes and curb the passions that would lead them astray. Mentoring means that we must instruct them in the ways of virtue. It means we must answer their questions and give them advice. It means we must spend time with them. And I would say, you know, some people would say it's being nosy, but you want to get to know your children's friends. Who are they hanging out with? Because it's, we all know what peer pressure is about. And that's when they get away, they know the right way. But they don't want to be seen as, uh, you know, you're just, you know, you're not going along with the crowd and everything else. So you need to know what kind of friends they're hanging out with. What's the content of their character? What are their parents like? Stay involved. Spend time with your children. Children need to be able to learn from their parents. There must be an atmosphere in the home that encourages questions. If your children are asking you tough questions, you should just be glad they're asking you instead of someone else. That means they trust you. They trust your counsel. They trust your advice. So sometimes you're going to get those tough questions. Just be glad they're not taking them to someone else. You can always find somebody who can help you get the answers for them if you don't know. Don't do anything to discourage them from coming to you. Once you break that trust, it's hard to get it back. So you want to encourage them to come to you. Point B, we mentor children by spending time with them. Anybody mind if I get on my soapbox for a minute? I have seen in recent years a lot of families, when you be in a restaurant, everybody, they're sitting together, physically they're there, but they're all in their own world, in their own devices. This can be used for good things. You can have your Bible apps on there. I have a promotion test coming up I can study. But it's a huge time vampire. And when you're sitting on your phone and your child comes up and asks you something and you're kind of just like, don't pay them any mind or didn't hear them, what kind of signal is that sending to them? Kind of like, can't see the cross because you're, you know, I think that's, that's sending them a bad signal. Your spouse, if, if you're not dropping what, you know, they come to talk to you and you're looking up uh, what the latest thing someone ate, they post a picture, oh, hey, uh, what does that, what does it really matter in the, in the end? 
does it matter what Bo, how much Bo lifted last week? If my wife needs to come to me and ask me something, I'm like, oh, look at Bo. Bench 450, okay, great. What, is that, what does it matter, honestly? They're, they're called smartphones, but I really think they're dumbing, our, dumbing us down. And I can't wait to get, once I don't have, once I'm out of the Air Force and I don't have to look, maintain a base Facebook page and that stuff, I'm, I'm getting a dumb phone, as dumb as it can get. I don't even want one that texts. Because if someone's going to take the time to bother me, they'll be like, I have to call you? Hey, if it's important enough that where you're going to interrupt my time, you will take the time to call me. It'll get rid of a lot of just like nonsensical whatever. I can't wait to get, oh, I will be so happy. So we mentor our children by spending time with them. It means we don't let Netflix raise them. Um, there's a lot of things that we just kind of appease with. Okay, there's a PlayStation, you got your tablet here and all this other stuff. That's not spending time with them. That's just kind of pacifying, right? But those devices aren't going to be outside playing basketball or throwing a ball or, hey, this kid's been mean to me and I want to come and talk to you about it. Those devices aren't going to give them that counsel. That's not going to be coming from the heart. Those are things that those devices aren't going to offer them. Effective mentoring requires that we invest time and energy in our children. A Cornell University study found that fathers of preschool children spend an average of 37.7 seconds per day in real meaningful contact with their children. In contrast, those same children watch 54 hours of television every week. Dad spends 37.7 seconds a day of meaningful contact. Not just like, hey, I got you in the car. We're both sitting in the car together. Like, engaged, like, talking. Uh, and 54 hours in front of the, the TV. That's alarming to me. I don't know if it's alarming to you. Um, but I, I look at this, well, I'm still kind of on my soapbox. What's that going to do for social interaction? Like actual, like, you go to have a physical relationship with somebody, and you spend a lot of time on, I, I just think this, it's, it's going to be difficult. Um, there's going to be studies written about how all this works. But nothing will ever replace that time, that physical time you actually spend and engage with them. That's what's actually going to, they're going to remember. Not, oh, dad liked my fake Facebook post. They're not going to, you know, who cares? But if you sat down and took the time to mentor them and help them work through a situation, that's when they're going to say, you know, Google doesn't solve everything. I'm going to actually go to dad and get his counsel instead of Google. On the section C, we mentor children by encouraging them. Look for opportunities to encourage your children. Someone said the best way to encourage children is to catch them doing something right. And we as human beings tend to look a lot on the negatives. negatives. We don't spend enough time encouraging people. It's always... Uh, I got, you know, 15 EPRs and X, Y, and Z. Hey, I got a job. My kids have clothes on their back. We got food in our bellies. I got a roof over my head. You know, we, we just tend to, like, focus. I think it's because our lives are so good that we just, you know, it, that's just normal. I have a place to live. I have food in my belly. <clears throat> so encouraging our children... Our children receive plenty of negative influences in their lives. They need positive reinforcement from us when they do things right. Does that mean, hey, you know, you get a trophy for everything you do that's right? No. But I'm saying spending that meaningful, you know, hey, I noticed that you did your chores today without me having to tell you. I appreciate that because it makes your mom and my life, it makes it a lot easier for us when we don't have to come behind you and tell you. You know what you're supposed to do. You took care of it. I appreciate that. 
That's the kind of encouragement we need to give them. Because it lets them know dad's paying attention. And he took the time to say he appreciates me for taking care of that, that section of the house. And I'm going to make sure I do a good job at it because I know he's watching and he appreciates that I do that. So I'm going to take, you know, maybe a wrapper fell out of the trash as they're taking it to the trash and they left it. But next time it's like, no, I'm going to make sure I get everything right. Give them that encouragement. Praise and encouragement are powerful tools. They can shape and motivate children to continue on the right path. There was a national survey done by the Human Development and Family Development at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. They studied families that showed signs of health. They cataloged the attributes of those families. The number one attribute that marked a strong family was appreciation for each other. Healthy families were marked by showing approval and giving sincere compliments. The family, remember, the family members tried to make each other feel appreciated and good about themselves. Say thank you. Look for ways to show your, appro your approval to your children. Look for positive actions that you can encourage. Our last point, point three, maintain consistent biblical teaching. The final key to leaving a godly legacy is to teach the Bible to our children. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says, We are to bring up our children in the admonition of the Lord. The word admonish means to warn or to caution against specific faults and to, uh, to encourage what is right. That's exactly what the Bible will do for us and that will do for our families if we're maintaining our devotionals reading the Bible with our children, staying in a Bible preaching church. And we can, I, I had, uh, my daughter asked me the other night, she said, why do some women try to look like men and why is that wrong? I didn't have a conversation about that with her at all. <laughs> uh, she just brought it up. And I said, well, let's see what the Bible has to say about it. And we had just, is in Ephesians, with, which is going through this study. And last week we talked about husbands love your wives as you love yourself. We don't hate our own flesh and we nourish ourselves. God gave us this body and we're supposed to be happy in it. And so I gave her that and it gave her comfort. It was like right before she was going to bed. She was just like, can you give me something out of the Bible that lets me know? I just read that and she was, oh, thank you, that's much better. The Bible has all the answers in it. God does not tell us to let our children make up their own minds. The Bible says to train them up, intentionally direct their steps and the way they should go. Reproof and correction need to be administered to bring their lives in line with the teaching of the Word of God. Point A, consistently teach the Bible in the home. Every home should be a Bible institute. God wants our homes to be places where the Bible is more than a piece of furniture or decoration. The Bible is to be part of our daily lives. Post scripture verses on the walls. <clears throat> Make the Bible real in your home and follow its instruction. Make the Bible real to your children is not a pastoral philosophy, it's the commandment of God. God wants his word to permeate our homes. He wants our children to see, hear, and learn the Bible in the home. Proverbs 1 verse 8 says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. This verse clearly lays out for us the role of parents as the primary instructors of values to their children. How can we teach our children in the home in such a way that they hear what we're saying? Point one, teach them diligently. The Hebrew word for teach used in Deuteronomy 6 verse 7 means to sharpen or wet. Just as a, sh a soldier would prepare their sword for use in a battle, we need to be paying attention, looking for opportunities to explain and apply the principles of God's word. 
because they're going to see a lot of things going on around them that are not right to the Christian values. And they're going to have those questions. And we're their instructors. We're with our children more than anybody else. It's not just Sunday morning at the church. We're with them all the time. And we need to be able to go to the Word of God and show them those answers on how they can know for sure. We need to be sharp, alert, and ready to teach. Point two, teach them daily. In our daily routines, we need to be talking about God and the Bible to our children. Far too many parents restrict God to Sundays. Okay, got the bulletin, that's my receipt that says I went to church. See you next Sunday, you know. Check that box. Hopefully the kids pick something up. I know they were coloring most of the time. That's not the way. They'll be exposed to it, how much they'll soak in, but walking daily with them and teaching them diligently <coughs> and daily is going to prepare them for the battle they have before them. Teach them directly. That's point three. If we're not careful, we may fall victim to the temptation to delegate this task in the busyness of life. Teaching requires presence and commitment. You can't raise your child via cell phone and email. Kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier. You have to be with them as much as you can and let them know that you're there for them. You're instructing them. You're taking that time because if you don't take the time with them, they're going to replace that absence with something else. <coughs> Netflix, Facebook, YouTube, whatever. You'll just get replaced by something else. Children don't learn everything the first time. Often they do not understand what we're trying to teach them. So start when they're young. There's something powerful about reading the Bible to our children. It lets them know there is a God in heaven who loves them. Teach them everything children their age can learn about God. Teach them principles from God's word. And the last point under section 3, point B, consistently teach the Bible in the church. I believe this is a, is a, uh, a, very, a, a great Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching church, but we're not always going to be here. Most of us are a transient audience or transient church. So we need, whenever we go to somewhere else, you need to seek out diligently to find that church that you can get connected into and feel good about plugging into and saying, this is where, this is where we're going to grow for the next X amount of years. Um, it's crucial as you're raising your children to have that good foundation with the church to be around the brethren that can help you in your walk <coughs> that have good children's ministries that can help them in their walk and just be an encouragement to you so that when you go out throughout the week and you, you're with them day in and day out you have that recharge and saying okay I've, I've been learning about this I've been in this Bible study my child's coming to me asking me questions about this. I've, we've gone through this. I know where to go. I know where to find it in the Bible. It's crucial. Um, so to conclude, teaching the Word of God at home and in the church gives our children the tools they need to succeed as Christian parents themselves. Really, that's, that's, the, main, that's the main point of it. We're raising children to be adults one day. They're only small for a little time. And so we want to raise them up to be, we're raising the next generation. We want to show them the right way to go. I want to thank you guys. Um, this is the last adult Sunday school class that I have through this curriculum. I just wanted to thank you guys uh, for putting up with me over the past few weeks as I'm filling in with the pastor being out, and um, 
it's been a it's been a blessing to me to go through some of these lessons and learn uh, some things as I'm preparing for class. So um, I appreciate you guys, uh, Brother Bruce. Would you please close us in a word of prayer?